I am an evolutionary psychologist, which means that I'm uh, interested in human nature. I'm interested in how our human nature came about by natural selection over the course of evolution. And uh, I'm especially interested in the nature of human children, and most especially in those aspects of children's nature that serve the function of their education. And as I argued yesterday in my talks, that children come into the world instinctively driven to educate themselves. They're curious in ways that lead them to explore the world and figure out what's around them, try to understand their world, both their physical world and their social world. They are playful in ways that lead them to play in the kinds of ways that lead them to develop all the sorts of skills that human beings have to develop to do well in the world in which they're born in. They're sociable, they make connections with other people, they learn language by nature. Every normal child learns language. You don't have to teach the child language. The child learns it on his own or her own. And with language, they learn so much more. They're paying attention to what other people are saying. They're asking questions. All of these characteristics of young children that they're born with, that is part of their human nature, serve the function of their education. So what I have focused especially on is play. Children's nature, children by nature want to play. They want to play all day long, and they especially want to play with other people. And so earlier today, I talked about really, de I, I defined play in a, in a way, I described five different characteristics of play. I'll very briefly summarize them here. But before I get to do that, I want to say something. This is something that I haven't um, talked about at all in any of my previous talks here. But in, in a certain sense, my work on play builds upon the work of a philosopher and naturalist named Carl Gruss, who uh, more than 100 years ago, back at the turn of the 19th to the 20th century, wrote two books. One was called The Play of Animals, and the other was called The Play of Man. And he, Gruss was somebody who, he was a follower of Darwin. He, he, he read Darwin's work. He, like, unlike so many other people, he understood Darwin. And in some ways, he actually developed ideas about evolution that even are more modern than Darwin's ideas. He actually carried Darwin's work farther. And, Bruce is not very well known, and certainly not very well known by psychologists, and very few people have read his books. But in his book called The Play of Animals, he asked this question, why do animals play? Why do young animals play? After all, you know, if you think about it, they're wasting energy. Why don't they just rest <laughs> when they don't have something that they have to do? Why don't they just rest? Why do they play? And why do they play and sometimes in ways that are risky? And so he came to the conclusion that the reason young animals play is because, especially young mammals play, is because they don't come into the world with their instincts fully formed. And in fact, it would be maladaptive to have their instincts fully formed. They have to play in ways that take into account the particular aspects of the world in which they're growing up in so they can practice the skills that they need to survive in that world. So he developed what has been called the practice theory of play, that the reason young animals play is because play is the vehicle through which they practice the kinds of skills that they need to survive and thrive in the world in which they're growing up. And uh, the evidence for this, the, basically the evidence is fairly simple. The part of the evidence comes from simply the fact that young animals play much more than older animals. Why? Because they've got more to learn. So that fits with the idea that play serves the purpose of learning. Moreover, those animal species that have to learn the most because their way of life is less dependent upon instinct and more dependent upon learning, those animals that have to play the most, that, that have to learn the most also play the most. So primates play more than non-primates. Um, 
mammals play much more than vertebrates do. Fish and uh, much more than non-mammal mammalian vertebrates do. Fish, it's hardly clear that they play at all. But uh, fish pretty much survive by instinct. They don't have to learn all that much. But mammals have to learn a certain amount. Uh, carnivores play more than herbivores. And the reason for that is it's, carnivores have more to learn. It's harder to capture game. It's harder to capture game. It's harder to be a predator than it is to be an herbivore. To be an herbivore, all you do is eat. It also, all you do is you know, eat grass or what's around. It's, you, know, you don't have to practice hunting. So, and the other, the other kind of evidence for his theory was that you could pretty much predict what an animal would play at, thank you, this is helpful. You could, thank you. All right, so you could pretty much predict what an animal would play at by knowing the constraints on that animal's existence. What are the skills that the animal has to learn? So Predatory animals like uh, tigers and, and wolves and so on play at predation. Uh, if you're a cat-like predator, you play at creeping up and pouncing. If you're a, a wolf-like predator, you play at chasing, running down your game. And uh, the game of cha the game, you know, games like tag are games that not just human beings play, but all mammals play. And, but when uh, predators play it, they play it in such a way that the preferred position is to be the one doing the chasing, chasing and capturing the other one. When prey animals play it, like deer, young deer are playing, the preferred position is to be the one running away. So the, prey, the young deer and young pre prey animals are playing at escaping from wolves and, and lions and such, whereas predatory animals are playing at capturing <laughs> prey animals. So whatever it is uh, that you have to learn in order to survive in the world you're growing up in, that's what young animals play at. So that was his thesis in The Play of Animals. And then he wrote another book called The Play of Man, in which he argued that human beings, that basically everything he said about other mammals is true for human beings, but even more so, and we have to add to that, human beings have much more to learn than any of the other animals do. And therefore, he said, when, he, when young humans are free, they play more than any other animals do. And if you observe children in, uh, in non-school cultures and in cultures where they're not forced to work, what you find is children are playing all the time. And they're playing in ways in which they're acquiring. They're playing at the kinds of skills that they have to learn. And moreover, he pointed out that another difference, besides the fact that we have to learn more, he pointed out that a difference between human beings and other, and other animals is that human beings, what we have to learn, depends not just on the species that we are. There are certain things that all human beings have to learn, just like there are certain things that all wolves have to learn or that all deer have to learn. But in addition to that, we have to learn the things that are unique to our culture. So depending upon what culture you're born in, you may have to learn different things. Or if you're born in a hunting culture, you have to learn how to hunt. If you're born in a farming culture, you have to learn how to farm. If you're born in a technological culture like we have, you have to learn how to use computers. And you have to learn the tools of our culture. So that the prediction that, so what Bruce suggested is that child, our, our, young, our youngsters, our children, come into the world not only with a very strong drive to play at those things that all human beings have to learn, like language, like two-legged walking, like getting along with other people, like controlling your emotions. These are things that people have to learn in every culture. But they also come biologically prepared to look around and see what is it that people do in your culture. What are the skills unique to your culture that you're growing up in that you have to become good at. And they, are in, they pay attention to that, and they play at those kinds of things. So that's what uh, that predicts, that children will play at different things depending upon the culture in which they're, they're, they grow up. So that was more than 100 years ago that he wrote that. And it was not too long after Darwin's Origin of Species was published that he developed that view. 
between uh, his work and uh, more recently my work and that of a few other people, there has been very little development of this idea. So I'm trying to bring back this idea that play is nature's way by which children um, learn the things that they have to learn in the culture in which they're growing up. This, this afternoon in my talk, I spent some time uh, defining play, and I don't want to go through all of that again, but what I, I listed on this handout here, um, definite defining characteristics of play, and these are the characteristics that I elaborated on this afternoon, but just very briefly, kind of as a review of that, my argument is that an activity is play to the degree that it has all five of these characteristics that I list here in the, in the handout under introduction. That it's self-chosen and self-directed. Play is always chosen by the players. Children decide themselves what to play. And not only do they decide themselves what to play, they decide how to play. If some adult or some authority figure is telling them what they have to play at or how to play it or directing their play, then it's not play. It's not really play by this definition of play. It's, it's, it may or may not be a useful activity. It may or may not be enjoyable, but it's not play. Play has to be self-chosen and self-directed. The second character is that play is intrinsically motivated. That means you're doing it for its own sake. You're not doing it for some reward outside of yourself, outside of itself. You're not doing it to get a trophy. You're not doing it to get praise. You're not doing it because uh, you think that it will help you get into college. You're doing it just because it's fun, just, because, just for its own sake. Is that, um, is that one not working? Is this one better? Okay. So, uh, so, that's the se so that's the second defining characteristic, that it's an activity that's intrinsically motivated. You're doing it because you want to do it, not because of something that you get for doing it in the end. The third characteristic is that play is always structured. It's always, there's no such thing as unstructured play. It's never random. And it's always structured in ways that it's, the structure of it lies in the player's minds. There are rules to how you play, and those are mental rules. Even the wildest kinds of play really has structure to it. Even like, a, as I described today, earlier on today, two boys at a play fight. You know, it looks wild, it looks random, but it's structured. There are rules to it. They, they are implicit rules. You can't kick, you can't bite, you can't scratch, you can't really hurt the other person. If you're the bigger of the two, you have to self-handicap. Those rules don't even have to be stated. They're implied. Both of the children playing in the play fight know that. So in any kind, in any kind of play, every kind of play, there are rules, and children in play are learning to follow rules, one of the most important things that they're learning in play. A fourth characteristic of play is that it always involves an element of imagination. There's always, uh, there's always an imaginative component. In some sense, you're always in a, in a pretend world when you're play, and you're exercising imagination in play, and imagination is involved in all higher order human thinking, and so children are practicing that in play. And the fifth characteristic of play has to do with the mental state of play. You know, the mental state of play is one where the mind is very active and alert and very involved in what you're doing, but is not highly stressed. Because if, we're, if you were highly stressed, you would just quit, because it, just as you can freely start to play, you can always freely quit. That's also part of the defining characteristic of play. You can, if you can't quit, it's really not play. So play is play, and you're in this kind of pretend world, so it doesn't really matter if you make a mistake. It doesn't matter if you fail. And so you're not stressed about it. You're not being evaluated by anybody for it. You are trying to do your best in play because, for the, because it's only fun if you're trying to do your best. 
But so what? If you screw up, it doesn't matter because it, you're not, there's no trophy on the line. It's not affecting your life. Nobody's going to punish you for it. Nobody's going to praise you for it if you do it well. So you're not losing anything if you make a mistake. You're free to fail in play. And that's why you're free to try things that you're not necessarily good at. That's why play is such a great state of mind for learning new things because you feel brave enough to try new things because it doesn't matter if, 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 if you don't do it perfectly. So that I all talked about earlier on today. And then, I, um, and then I, what I want to do now is sort of go through some of the categories No, I prefer to stand up. <laughs> okay, so um, the uh, so the uh, so there's so what I want to do now, and what I've put here on this handout, is certain categories of development, and I want to talk about primarily by giving some examples of what children uh, learn in each of these categories of development. I'm going to kind of skip A, play and physical development, because in some ways it's so obvious. When play, children are playing in vigorous ways, they're developing their bodies, they're developing their ability to coordinate their movements, you, you become strong and you become graceful by playing in physical ways. And when children are deprived of such play, they don't, they're, they're, they don't develop good heart and lung capacity. They don't develop strong muscles. They don't develop graceful ways of movement. And so that's what kind of play that we share with all other animals. All animals play in physical ways, and that's how they develop their physical bodies. Children also play at constructing things, building things, and that's the kind of physical play in a different way. It's mental too, but you're also learning how to use your hands to construct things, use those opposable thumbs in useful ways, how to make tools, how to create the things that in whatever culture you're in, you, you need to be able to create in order to be successful in that culture. But I want to move to B and begin to elaborate on, on these other things, these more psychological characters that are developed at play. Play and social moral development. So let me just kind of go through this handout at point by point and elaborate in some cases with examples. So play is how children learn to make friends, follow rules, see from others' points of view, and negotiate differences. This is something I talked about earlier today, so again, I won't elaborate too much. But think of it, when children are playing together, they have to decide what they're going to play. And they have to come to some kind of agreement on that. They have to decide how they're going to play. They have to learn how to negotiate with one another. They have to figure out ways of meeting one another's needs, because if somebody isn't happy in play, they'll just quit. You're always free to quit. And children are really motivated to play with other children, so they're motivated to keep the, uh, their playmates happy, because if they don't keep their playmates happy, then they won't have any playmate anymore. And so one of the most important things we human beings have to learn is to how to make friends with people, how to keep our friends. How to, and that really means be, being able to pay attention to whether the other person that we're interacting with is happy or not happy. Are they having a good time? And if they're not having a good time, we need to modify what we're doing to be sure they're having a good time. Otherwise, they won't be our playmate anymore. And that's the same kind of skill that's necessary throughout life in all social relationships. If you can't do that, you can't have a good marriage or you can't have good work partners, you can't have real friends, you can't really have people to cooperate with, and we absolutely depend upon all of that for the happiness of our life. So children are constantly practicing that in play. When there's no adults there to solve their problems for them, they have to figure out how to solve these problems themselves, and that part of that means being able to be attuned to their playmates, whether, whether their playmates are having a good time or not. They're not necessarily conscious of learning this, but they are learning this because that's how, because if they don't lo learn it, then, then their playmates are going to leave them. And that is a sort of natural form of punishment for being a bully or for being insensitive to the other person's needs. So that happens in play. And I want to think, I want to point out the difference between 
Um, just to illustrate this, think of the difference between an old-fashioned, what in America we call a pickup game of baseball, which means that the kids are just out there, they all show up in the field uh, hoping there will be other kids to play with. Once you're there, you create a game. There's no adult there. You're just going out. This is the way, when I grew up, this is the way we all played baseball. There were never any adults around. We would just go out to the vacant lot. Other kids would be out there. Once we've got enough kids, we choose up teams and we start to play. We figure out how to play a game of baseball. Now think of all the things, all the skills that children practice when they're doing that. Skills that are way more important than baseball. The first thing you have to do is you have to create the game. You, there's no manicured field already there. You have to create the field. And you have to establish certain rules. Like maybe there's a big building here with windows. And you, and you know that if you break that window over there, somebody's going to get mad at you. So you've got to have a rule, no hitting it in that direction. Automatic out if it ever goes in that direction. You've got big kids and you've got little kids. How are you going to handle this difference, big kids and little kids? You've got to balance the teams, have an equal number of big kids and little kids on each team. But moreover, you've got to have some other rules, otherwise it's no fun. So the big kids who can just knock the ball way out into the street, you, ha you handicap them in some way. They have to bat you know, with a broomstick with their left hand if they're right-handed or their right hand if they're left-handed. They you, you handicap them some way to make it harder for them. Otherwise, they're going to dominate the whole game. Some of the kids come and they've got gloves. Others don't have any fielding gloves. You've got to be willing to share your equipment. You've got to, you've, you don't have an umpire to call balls and strikes, so you have to figure out how, you, how you're going to deal with that. Maybe you're going to have one of the teammates on each team call balls and strikes. You don't have a coach to decide who's going to be pitcher, who's going to be first base, who's going to be second base, so you have to negotiate all of that. You're spending an enormous amount of time negotiating and figuring things out. Think how important those skills are. Those are the kinds of skills that allow you later on to be a good person in the workplace, to be a good CEO, for example, to be the, a good negotiator, a good politician, to be a good neighbor, all the kinds of things that we think of as really important social skills are being developed. You are creating the rules of the game. You're, so, so children, when they're playing, it doesn't matter whether they're playing baseball or whether they're playing soccer or they're playing football or whatever they're playing, they are learning all of these really important skills that involve creativity, that involve how do you make rules for this game, involve coming to agreements, involve settling disagreements among one another. The least important thing that they're learning is baseball. They may be learning some baseball too. Baseball is the excuse that has them being out there. That's fun to play, but it's the process of making this game happen that the real learning is occurring. Now today in the United States, you almost never find this kind of game. Children aren't going out and making their own games. Instead, what's happening is you have little league or you have adult, you have adult directed sports. Now the field is all set up for you. The adults choose the team. The adults are there to umpire. The adults say who's going to pitch and who isn't going to pitch and they even tell you how to pitch. None of any of this stuff that I'm describing that's so important to learn, the kids aren't doing any of that. The adults are doing it all. So Little League might be a good place to learn how to bunt or to learn how to slide into second base. But those are not, for, for the great majority of people, those are not important life skills. There might be a tiny number who are going to go on to become professional baseball players for whom that's important. But for the great majority of children, the ultimate learning that comes from that is irrelevant to the rest of their life. So what we, we think we're doing children a favor when we set up the game for them and we solve all the problems for them and we give them trophies when they win and all of that stuff, but in fact we're ruining it. We're absolutely ruining it. We're taking away the whole value of play because the whole value of play lies in the fact that children are developing it themselves. 
And when we develop for them, we're taking away that value of play. Throughout human history, children always played with other children. Never did adults set up play for them. It's only in modern times that we've done that. Play evolved under conditions in which it was always children who were creating the play. And the reason it, reason it evolved is because children learn so much when they have to create their own play. But we're we've taken that away from children. Earlier today, I talked about some of the consequences of our taking that away, some of the psychological damage that has been done to children as a result of our depriving them of the opportunity really to learn the skills that one has to learn if you create your own play. So that, uh, I want to I give another example. I, that was an example kind of the typical kids who would go out to play pickup games might range in age from six or seven on up to about 18 or so. Uh, let me give an example of play among younger children than that. And this example that I'm going to describe comes uh, from the work of Hans Firth. Uh, so if you're still looking at this handout, we're at this point, uh, uh, Hans Firth's idea of play as children's way of constructing society. Firth wrote a book uh, in, in, called Desire for Society, Children's Knowledge as Social Imagination. And in this book, he spends a fair amount of time analyzing just one scene uh, of play of three little girls in a preschool kind of setting. I guess today it would be called a preschool. Uh, at that time it was called a nursery school. Uh, and it was a setting in which children, in, in which there was a dress up area where children would sort of play fantasy games. And there were children there, uh, typical children were three and four years old. And this particular example of play involved three little girls named Annie, who was five, and Beth, who was five, and Celia, who was four. And they were in the dress-up area, and they decided that they were going to play a game uh, in which they were going to get ready for a ball at the king's palace. And they were going to go to the king's palace, and they were going to get all dressed up to go to the king's palace. And so, the, among other things, they had to negotiate who was going to get to wear which things. So everybody wanted to wear the most beautiful dress that was in the dress-up area, or the most beautiful necklace. And so there would be a lot of discussion. Who gets to wear this, and who, who gets to wear that? And people would say, you know, I would like to have this necklace and wear this necklace. And so, there, so there's a lot of negotiation about who gets to wear what. And then there was negotiation about um, uh, about what role they would be. <laughs> Having a lot of microphone problems, apparently. <laughs> I guess it's working. So then there was negotiation about what role they would, what roles that they would be playing. And, um, so Annie and Beth, who were the two older girls, both five years old, said that they would be, they would all three be sisters, and Annie and Beth would be the big sisters, and Celia would be the little sister. Celia's four and she's smaller. But Celia objected. She, at home, she was the little sister, and she was tired of being the little sister. She wanted to be the big sister. And so there was a lot of discussion about that. And it became pretty clear that Celia was adamant. She was not going to play if she had to be the little. This is out. She was not going to play if she had to be the little sister. So what were Annie and Beth going to do about that? They sort of needed Celia because it isn't a very fun game with just two people. I wonder if we should just do away with the microphones. <laughs> so, um, so they finally said, okay, Celia, you can be the big sister, but we will be the mothers. <laughs> 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 
and, and that seemed okay. Silly was fine. She, all her life she wanted to be the big sister. But to keep their relative status, Beth and Anna decided, Annie decided they had to be the mothers. Well, then they had some discussion. Well, can Celia have two mothers? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, at that time, today two mothers wouldn't be so rare, at least not in the United States. But at that time it was rare. At that time it was kind of, at least by these little girls, unheard of. So they had a big discussion. Is it okay for Celia to have two mothers? One of the characteristics of play is that even though children are playing in, in, in a fantasy world, it, it kind of mimics the rules of the real world. And it's one of the ways in which they reinforce in their own minds the, the rules of the real world. So they had a real discussion about this. They finally came to the conclusion, all right, in the real world, you can only have one mother. But we're just playing, and, <laughs> and here it will be two mothers. It's okay, two mothers. All right, so they, they settled on that, and then they had to decide what names would they be in play. And Annie wanted to be Gloria. And Beth said, no, I really want to be Gloria. And Celia said, I want to be Gloria. <laughs> And so they had a big discussion about that, who would get to be Gloria, and nobody, nobody was willing to give in on that, so they decided they could all be Gloria. <laughs> so <laughs> here's three little sisters, all named Gloria, three little, I mean, two mothers and a, and a daughter, <laughs> two mothers and a big sister, <laughs> all named Gloria, and they're now getting ready to go to the ball. Well, then the next thing they decided is who gets to marry the prince? <laughs> so. Annie said, I want to marry the prince. Beth said, I want to marry the prince. And then they had a discussion, can two people marry the prince? <laughs> and once again, the discussion went this way. In real life, two people can't marry the prince. But in play, we can say two it's OK for both of us to marry the prince. And then Celia said, but I want to marry the prince. Well, that was too much. <laughs> two people marrying the prince is one thing, but three Three girls marrying the prince, that's too much. And so they, they, Annie and Beth refused to grant Celia the opportunity to marry the prince. But to placate her, she, they said, not only are you the big sister, but you are big sister princess. And so that placated Celia. Now, so the point I'm making is think of all this discussion that's going on here. Each girl had needs that she wanted to fulfill in this context of play. But the only way the play could progress is if everybody's needs were fulfilled at least enough that they weren't going to quit. And so that meant a lot of discussion, a lot of compromise. I mean, for every one minute of actually playing, there's probably about 20 minutes of discussion about how they're playing, negotiation about it. That's where the real learning is occurring. Now, if there was an adult there settling all of this for them, that would just all be spoiled. They wouldn't be going through this whole process. And think, these are just four, three and four years old, or four and five years old. Think of the brilliance of the discussion that they're having here. They would also use tag questions. So somebody would say, I'm the one who's going to wear this necklace, right? It's as if they're asking permission. They're stating it, but they're also asking permission because they recognize that they really do need anything they do, they need the permission of the other players because otherwise, if they just go ahead and do it, they're acting like a bully. They're acting like they're dominating, and that's not going to please the other players. And so, the, so children learn in the context of play that you have to get consensus for whatever you're doing. And these little girls were very good at doing that. Um, so the um, so Firth pointed out that that there were certain meta rules. These are called these are sort of overarching rules that he observed in this in this uh, setting, in this play school, if we call it a play school, in this nursery school, if we call it that. And here are, here are some of the rules that he observed. These aren't necess the, the children didn't necessarily articulate these rules, although sometimes they did. And they didn't always use these names for the rules. But one of the rules is the finder's rule. So if you are the first person to find something, then you have some legitimate claim on being able to use that thing. So if you're the one who finds this beautiful necklace as you're digging through the chest of things, you have the right to say, okay, I'm going to use that. The first one who finds it sort of gets to use it. 
But another rule that can sometimes trump the finder's rule is the fairness rule. If you've already found and have this beautiful necklace and now you find this beautiful scarf and you claim both, that's not really fair. <laughs> you've got both of the two favorite things that everybody wants. And so now somebody will say, but that's not fair. Children are very sensitive about fairness. A lot of the discussion among even little children in play is about what's fair and what's not fair. And it's very important to be fair. And it's not fair for one child to hoard all the things that the other children also want. So that rule comes into play. There's the consistency rule, which is that you, you have to kind of follow, you have to be consistent. If you've, if you've set up a pattern of play, unless you deliberately change the pattern and everybody agrees to that change, you can't just arbitrarily disregard the pattern that you've already set. So an example of the consistency rule came in this example of play when it, when they set up the play they said okay what we're doing is we're preparing to go to the ball tomorrow. We'll be going to the ball tomorrow and now we're preparing. We're finding all the clothes we want to wear. We're doing all of these things. So at some point now they've got the clothes and Annie said okay so let's go to the ball. Annie was very eager to f marry the prince and so she wanted right then to go to the ball. And Beth reminded her, no, we, we are going to the ball tomorrow. Remember, we're going tomorrow. <laughs> so they had to have a pretend night of sleep before they could go to the ball. So that's the consistency rule. You're keeping track. So, so this is a kind of cognitive process that children are doing. They're learning how to remember what they said and you have to be consistent with what you said. So here's this very simple, there's nothing remarkable about this example of play. Children play like this all the time uh, when we allow them to play. But when you look at it, as Firth did, and he actually filmed it kind of inconspicuously and uh, then analyzed it, when you look at it this way, it's really quite amazing. And these are, not, these are not remarkable children. These are just typical children. It's really amazing what children are doing in play, the complexity of what they're doing, the kinds of problems they're solving, social problems that they're solving, the mental growth that's occurring in the process of doing all of that. So I, let, I want to give another example of observing children play. And this second example comes um, from the work of um, of uh, Vivian Paley. I don't know if you've ever heard of Vivian Paley, but she is, uh, she is uh, somebody in America who for many years was a nursery school teacher and a kindergarten teacher in various different places. And ultimately she became kind of famous and she became somebody who would visit a lot of nursery schools and kindergartens and help teachers learn how to be good teachers in those kinds of places or good um, teacher isn't really quite the right word. She wouldn't probably want to use the word teacher but good uh, uh, monitors, good people to be there to make sure that it's safe and so on and so forth. But what Vivian Paley did in her, all the kindergartens and, and preschools that she, the nursery schools that she worked in was basically she considered these are places to play. Children at this age should just be playing but she was a really keen observer of play. And so she, and then she wrote little stories, little books. These are marvelous little books about children's, about what she observed in children's play. And by reading those books, you really gain a tremendous admiration for children's competence, even little children's competence and what they're observing in play. And I want to, um, give an example from her work. This is a case that was where she was visiting a nursery school that was not her own nursery school and she described this following scene which she uh, calls the robber in the doll's corner. And here's the way the scene goes. So um, Molly who's three years old is playing with a toy in the doll corner and Frederick who's three years old comes into the doll corner and pulls the toy away from Molly. Just grabs the, as three-year-olds will, especially three-year-old boys, pulled the toy away from Molly and Molly started to cry. 
And the teacher came over and scolded Frederick, sent him off. Cedric's sulky and angry, goes off, and Molly now stops crying finally, and then she starts playing with the toy again. Now, a little bit later, Frederick comes back into the dollhouse again, into the doll area again, and again snatches the toy away from Molly. And again, Molly starts to cry, but this time, fortunately, the teacher doesn't notice it. The teacher is off doing something else. So the children solve the problem themselves, and they solve the problem in a far more brilliant way than the teacher does. So here's how the children solve it. So Frederick snatches the toy away from Molly, but then, and Molly starts to cry, and then Libby, who's four years old, one year older than Frederick or Molly, says to Molly, don't let him come to your birthday party. <laughs> He's just a robber, right? And so Molly stops crying. And then Frederick says, yeah, I'm a robber, <laughs> right? Well, says Libby, too bad for you because robbers aren't allowed in the doll corner. And then Samantha steps in, who's also four, and she says, he, he doesn't have to be a robber, he could be a father. <laughs> And Molly can be the baby. Get in the crib, sweet child. And now suddenly, Frederick is drawn into play. He's no longer the bad boy. Now he's a playmate. Somehow the, child, the teacher couldn't do it, but the children themselves can solve the problem by turning it into play rather than just treating Frederick as the bad boy who has to be, a, who has to be sent out of the area. So here's how uh, Paley herself sums it up. The moment Frederick, the bad boy, becomes Frederick the robber, the problem can be addressed according to the rules of play, where characters can easily change their pers personas on demand to suit the ongoing story. So that's another nice example of uh, really even little children's social brilliance when we allow them to solve their own problems rather than we stepping in to always solve their problems for them. I think we would be so much better off and our children would be so much better off if we ignored much more of their problems and allowed them to figure out how to solve them themselves. Let little Molly cry and let somebody else solve the problem. Molly's not going to Mo Molly's not going to be devastated by, by Frederick. And, and, she, and she and the other girls are going to learn how to deal with the Fredericks of the world and deal with them in a way that they don't necessarily turn them into enemies in the long run. All right, so let me, um, let me give another couple of examples on play and social moral development. Well, I talked earlier about Vygotsky. Maybe I'll skip that one. Piaget is somebody who is very famous for, for uh, his theory of development, much of which I disagree with. But one thing that I agree with Piaget about is his idea that children in play, in their own play away from adults, develop a more sophisticated understanding of rules and the purpose of rules than they develop when they're playing with adults. When children are playing with adults, they see, or are learning from adults, they see rules as sort of invariable mandates. The rule comes from on high in some way, and a rule can't be violated. When children are playing with other children, and they have to create the rules and modify the rules, they develop a more democratic sense of what rules are. They're not necessarily these inflexible, unvariable mandates produced by God. Rather, they are human contrivances that serve the function of trying to make life more fair and more fun. And if, if a rule isn't working for that purpose, you can change it. And so Piaget developed this observing children playing marbles. And, what, and he looked at it developmentally. Little children, when they first start playing marbles, they believe, even though they're not very good at following rules, they don't understand that you could just change the rules. 
But when they, as they develop and as they're playing with other children in rules, they realize that every place you're playing marbles, there's a different kind of setup for the marbles, and you have to kind of create the rules. And, and depending upon who's playing and how the game is going, you can modify the rules to make the game fun and more fair. And so he was, he presented in his book on moral development, the moral development of the child, he presented the idea that so much moral development is occurring when children are playing with one another that can't occur when children are playing with adults because the gap in authority is too great when children are playing with adults. So children don't naturally negotiate with adults. Nowadays maybe they do more than they did in Piaget's time. But certainly in Piaget's time adults were regarded as authority figures and certainly teachers in school are regarded as authority figures. So you don't question the rule that an adult gives you. But if it's another child telling you the rule, the authority d gap is not so great that you might question it. And then you need to have the discussion about the rule. And then you realize that you could maybe change the rule. And so democracy emerges from that rather than autocracy. The classroom, of course, is an autocracy. The teacher is in charge and the students have to do what they're told to do. The play setting is a democracy. There's nobody ultimately in charge. And therefore, you have to figure out democratically by consensus what to do. And you develop a more democratic understanding of what rules are all about. Let me go now to see here, play and emotional development. Um, the, uh, I, I, talk, I refer here on the handout to the emotional regulation theory of play derived from animal research. Animal researchers um, began to, uh, one of the theories of play that's come out of studying play in animals is the idea that one of the purposes of play is to teach young animals how to regulate their negative emotions, how to control fear and how to control anger. And it's an interesting to observe that all young mammals play in what look like dangerous ways. Um, monkeys will swing playfully chasing one another around from branch to branch where they can, even the branches are so far apart they can just barely make it. The branches are high enough that if they fell they might actually hurt themselves. They wouldn't kill themselves, but they could injure themselves. They're playing in dangerous ways. Why do they play in those dangerous ways? Goat kids romp along uh, cliffs. Um, all sorts of animals play fight in ways when potentially somebody could get hurt in the play fight. Um, our children, of course, when they're free to play, play in these dangerous ways. And unfortunately, we try to stop them from playing in these dangerous ways. They climb trees too high. They swing too high in the swings. They walk up the slide and down the slide when, when the slide is high enough that they could fall and get hurt. They're play fighting in ways that they possibly could get hurt. They love to play with actual danger. They like to play with fire and they like to play with knives and they like to play with sharp tools. They like to play in all of these dangerous things. Why do they like to do that? And the theory that was developed primarily from observing animals is that they're playing in these dangerous ways because they're learning how to be courageous. They're learning how to control fear. They're deliberately, if you will, putting themselves into moderately fearful situations and proving them to themselves that they can keep their heads while in that moderately fearful situation. How high can I climb in that tree? and not be terrorized. And the little girl who's climbing the tree, every time she goes, she goes a little bit higher. And she comes down and feels so proud. I climbed that tree, you know, and I live to tell the story. I made it alive. That little girl then goes on in life feeling like I can handle things. I can take care of fear. Something awful happens. I know I can keep my head about it. I'm not going to panic. That's what children are learning when they're playing that way and presumably other young mammals are learning that kind of thing when they're playing that way. Sometimes in play, and this is true for anim other animals as well as humans, the players get mad at one another. So maybe they're having an argument about who gets to wear the necklace and the argument gets too far and somebody starts to get mad at the other person. And then what happens when you get mad? If you get really mad or you have a tantrum, I mean a tantrum might work with parents. You might get your way with a tantrum with your parents, but it never works with playmates. 
Playmates have no sympathy for a tantrum. If you have a tantrum, that play just ends. They're just going to go off and leave you having your tantrum. If you fight, if you get angry and you hit somebody, that ends the play too. These things do happen, but they're not successful in play. What's successful, they're not successful because they end the play. And you really don't want to end the play. You, you are born wanting to play with other kids. So you've gotten angry, something has happened that's made you angry. If you want to continue playing, you have to be able to deal with that anger in a way that doesn't end the play. So that means you can't have a tantrum. You can't hit the other person. On the other hand, you don't want to continue to be hurt or abused by your playmate. So you have to learn how to be assertive. You say, hey, wait a minute, stop that. <laughs> that really hurt or that really bothered me or I'm not, I'm not going to play anymore unless, unless you're willing to share some of these things with me. Children learn to be assertive in play without being violent in play. Now that doesn't mean that they never are violent, but they learn that violence ends the play. And so it's in play that children learn how to assert their needs in a way that maintains the relationship without destroying the relationship. And this occurs in other animals too. Other animals when they're play fighting, one animal, they're play fighting, they're playfully nipping one another. One animal nips a little too hard. <laughs> And the other animal now has a choice. Either I can really bite back, <laughs> and now it's a fight. Now it's a real fight. What was a play fight becomes a real fight. Or I can step back, and I can give a kind of warning signal that indicates, hey, that really hurt. And now the other animal has a choice of what to do. Other, all species of animals that play fight have a signal that's basically an apology signal. And it's for, the, for dogs or wolves and those kinds of animals, it's called the play bow. The animal bows its head way down to the ground. Rump goes up in the air and the head goes down. And that's basically a statement of, I didn't mean to hurt you. <laughs> I am putting myself right now into a submissive position to show you that I didn't mean to hurt you. So that one animal play bows, that's basically an apology. And the other animal play bows back and now that's like an agreement, okay, we're all right now, we can cut back to playing again. And, hum and human beings have their own ways of doing this. We can do it verbally, not necessarily just with nonverbal kinds of signals. So play is very important for learning how to control fear, learning how to control anger. There's some interesting, you know, with human beings you can't do these kinds of experiments, but with animals, there are certain experiments we, you can do which are called play deprivation experiments. Um, used to be done with monkeys, but nowadays people don't do it with monkeys anymore because it's regarded as cruel to do this with monkeys. So they do it with rats instead. Apparently you can do anything with rats. Nobody likes rats. So, the, uh, so here's a typical experiment. Used to be done with monkeys and, and it works equally well with monkeys or rats. You raise one group of animals in a way such that they're play deprived. They don't have the opportunity to play when they're growing up. But they have other social experiences and there's different ways of doing this. So for example, if you raise young monkeys or young rats just with adults, the adults will interact with them but the adults won't play with them. Adult monkeys and, and adult rats just really don't play with young. So they're growing up in an environment where they have other social experiences because they're with adults but they don't have the opportunity to play. And then, and the other group of animals is raised in the same way but they at least get some opportunity to play. There's a certain amount of time every day where they're paired with another young rat who plays and so they have the opportunity to play. Then when you test them in adulthood, what you find out is that those rats and or monkeys that have been that have been play deprived are emotionally crippled. They, we put them into a novel environment and they freeze in the corner with fear. They haven't developed courage. They free, all animals when they're put in a novel environment at first freeze in the corner with fear. But a normal animal, an animal that's had the opportunity to play begins to explore eventually and gradually overcomes its fear and is soon exploring that novel environment. The animals, whether it's monkeys or rats that were raised without play, just stay in the corner. They don't have the courage to go out and explore. 
If you take a play-deprived monkey uh, and you pair this monkey now, and it's now an adult, it's a young adult, you pair this monkey now with a peer, another young adult, what you find is completely inappropriate social behavior. There's an alternation between lashing out with inappropriate aggression, inappropriate and ineffective aggression, or cowering away. There's, a, there's an alternation of this uncontrolled aggression and, and uncontrollable fear. The animal doesn't know how to deal with this stranger. Whereas if it's a, not a play deprived, there may be a little bickering in the beginning, maybe a little testing, but ultimately they figure out how to get along with one another. So play deprived animals are socially and emotionally crippled. And it's not surprising, I talked earlier about how our children today are play deprived and I argued that there's research suggesting that to some degree our children today are emotionally and socially crippled compared to children in the past when children had much more opportunity to play. They're much more likely to get panicky, there are higher rates of narcissism at least in the United States in this day and age when children are, um, are play deprived much more than they used to be because they're spending so much of their time in school and so much of their time in adult directed activities that they're having little opportunity to play. Let me now go on down to, um, to play and intellectual development and let me just give, I want to wrap it up pretty quickly, but let me just describe uh, two or three kinds of research studies that I think help illustrate the role of play in children's intellectual development and their cognitive development. So one, um, there's a researcher who's named Teresa Amabila. She's, um, she's now at Harvard University in the business school. Um, but she's done research, um, a lot of research on creativity. What are the conditions that lead somebody to be very creative and to be able to produce a creative product? And one kind of experiment that she would do, and she did many different replications of this experiment, would be to have people, sometimes it would be children, sometimes it would be adults as her subjects, and she would ask them to produce some kind of a creative project. Maybe it was to draw a painting or to write a poem or to produce, uh, um, uh, to, to produce a, a, little, a little new piece of music. Whatever it was she asked them to do, uh, she did it in two conditions. In one condition, she would say, she would make it kind of competitive. She would say, if whoever does the best will get a reward. Um, and or, or she would say that if, if it meets the qualification of the judges, you will get, you will get a prize for doing so. And so in this case, the people were doing it under what would be called a non-playful condition. This would be the condition where you're doing it for a reward. You're trying to do your best. You know it's going to be judged. The other condition was one in which she would say, I just want you to do this. Don't put your name on it. Nobody's going to know who did what. I just want you to do it for fun, right? And so these people would turn it in, no name on it at all. But of course the researchers would know which group that they came from, whether it was done in the, by somebody who was told to, that they were doing it for a reward and some group that was told they were just doing it for fun. And then they would have these things evaluated by judges that didn't know which group it came from. And the judges would be kind of experts in in creativity. Now it's hard to define creativity but apparently you can recognize it because the judges were pretty consistent. If one judge said this was really creative and that one's not, other judges tended to say the same thing. So whatever creativity is, it's something that the judges could identify fairly well. Well the result of experiment after experiment in this mode was that those who were doing it just for fun whose name wasn't all even going to be on it. Their products were generally judged as more creative than the products of those who were trying to be creative be, and trying to win a prize by being creative. So the very situation of being judged which puts you in a non-creative, non-playful mood because now you're doing it for a reward. Now you're doing it to please somebody else rather than just for fun. 
that makes you less creative. I gave another example of that earlier today, and there's many examples that show, uh, that illustrate this fact, that if you're, if to be creative, whether it involves creative reason, reasoning or creative artistic ability, it's better not to think about it, any kind of evaluation of it. Teresa Amabile also interviewed many highly creative people, authors and so on, um, movie makers, artists, and she would ask them about the state of mind that they had to be in to do their creative work. And person after person would tell her, I have to completely set aside any thoughts about my audience. I no longer, th I, don't, I can't think about my critics. I can't think about whether I'm going to make any money doing this. I just have to let myself be buried in this thing itself. I have to convince myself that I'm just doing this for my own sake, for my own fun, because otherwise my mind, gets, my mind gets burdened and stressed by my concern about what other people are going to think about it, and that ruins the creative process. So the playful state of mind, the state of mind in which you're just doing it for its own sake, that's the state of mind that works best for producing new things. Let me give another, this is an experiment a study with four-year-olds about the role of play in reasoning. So here's, I said earlier on that there's a lot of Piaget that I disagree with, and one of the, um, uh, one of Piaget's major ideas that I very much disagree with is this idea that children go through different stages of development. The children think differently at different ages that little children cannot think in formal operations. They can't think abstractly. And it's only after a certain age that children can think abstractly. But my observations in children in many different settings is that little children can think very well abstractly. It's just that they don't know as much. They don't have as much information. Their way of thinking isn't different from ours. It's just that they don't have as much information about the world. And if you can provide the logic question in the right context, they can answer the same kinds of logic questions correctly as any older children can do. So let me give you an example of a study that uh, challenged Piaget. So one of Piaget's claims, as I just said, was that children below the age of about 11 can't solve logic problems that inf involve a formal operational reasoning, which means reasoning about something that you can't see, that is counterfactual. And the way that he tested them, the well, way that Piaget tested his children, was by giving them um, uh, syllogisms to solve. And a syllogism, as you may know, is a problem where there's two statements that are given, two premises. There's a major premise and a minor premise. And then, based on those two premises, you have to decide, if you accept those two premises as true, you have to decide whether something else is true or false. A counterfactual syllogism is a syllogism in which the major premise is counterfactual. It's something that in the real world is not true. But in the problem world, you have to, ima you have to imagine that it's true. You act have to think as if it's true, if this is true and that's true, then what else has to follow from that? So let me give you an example to make this concrete of a counterfactual syllogism. This is one that Piaget used. Um, let me just find it here. That's sort of... Okay, so here's um, an example of counterfactual syllogism is this. All cats bark. All right, that's the counterfactual major premise. In the real world, of course, dogs bark, cats don't bark. But the first premise, all cats bark. And the second premise is muffins is a cat. And then the question you have to answer is does muffins bark? Now, you and I know that this is a kind of a game. <laughs> in which, because we know about syllogisms, we know what logicians do, we know what you're supposed to do here. You're supposed to imagine a world in which cats bark, and all, in which all cats bark, and, and muffins is a cat, and so of course we would say muffins barks. A typical 11 or 12 year old would also say that. 
But if you present the problem in the way I just presented it, and, or the way that Piaget presented it, if you present it to a younger child, a child of six or so, the child is likely to say, no, cats don't bark. <laughs> Muffins would say, meow. So the child is answering in terms of the real world, not in terms of this hypothetical premise. Well, so uh, researchers in England, uh, Paul Harris and his colleagues, decided, is this really a fundamental difference in logic, or is it just that the child doesn't really understand what the researcher is trying to do here? The child sees this adult, and it's in a serious context, and thinks that the adult wants a serious answer about the real world. And it would be silly to say that, that, uh, that cats bark. <laughs> you know? So the child answers in the way of the real world. But what would happen if you made it obvious to the child that we're talking about a pretend world and not the real world? So they did it this way. They said, so that little child is here, and they did this with four-year-olds. I'm looking into a box here, and in this box there's another world, and I see a lot of cats in there. Oh, and all the cats bark. All the cats in this world bark. <gasps> Muffins is a cat. Does Muffins bark? Now the four-year-old immediately says, Muffins barks. When it's presented in the context of play, and children can understand in play, you can have imaginary things, pretend things that aren't like the real world. In the context of play, the four-year-old solves the problem easily. The very problem that Piaget said you can't solve until you're 11 or older. If you just make it clear this is about a pretend world, the older child knows this is about a pretend world. But the younger child doesn't. If you make it clear this is about a pretend world, then the younger child can solve the problem. In a sense, all of logic is about pretend. Let's pretend this is true, and then what's that true? And children are always practicing the ability to be logical in a pretend world. In fact, once they discovered four-year-olds could do it, they went to two-year-olds. And two-year-olds even got it right in that context. Barely able to talk, and they can already solve the counterfactual problem that Piaget claim that they're not able to solve because they can't think in terms of imagined entities. They can only think in terms of real concrete things that exist in the real world. So that's just an example of how in play, even by these kind of logistic problems, these sort of abstract problems, children are so much smarter in the context of play than they are when they're thinking about the real world. They're practicing all of these all of these complex abilities that then later on they're being able to bring into uh, their activities in the real world. So um, I think that I've probably talked long enough and so what I want to do now is really bring it to a close. What I've tried to do is simply illustrate with a number of examples, um, with a number of examples uh, how brilliant children are when they're playing how really brilliant they are and how much we could learn from children if we didn't intervene, but we just sort of sat back and inconspicuously observed and admired what they're doing in play. We would develop a whole different concept of children. We wouldn't think of children as so helpless and so stupid and so constantly needing our direction and guidance. We would begin to think of them actually as people that we might actually be able to learn something from who are always thinking, always learning, always bringing something new to bear in what they're doing. There's one other uh, point, actually, that I realize I also wanted to make. And, and this, is, um, this is something that's really, uh, really very disturbing to me, disturbing to a lot of people. Increasingly, throughout the world, we are giving academic instruction to younger and younger children. You know, at one point it started in first grade. That was the first point at which children would have any actual training, be doing worksheets, be having to be taught to read or do numbers and stuff. And then they started doing that in kindergarten. And then they started developing preschools to do that already. You know, now I hear of two-year-olds, three-year-olds, you know, being sat down in worksheets and worrying about whether they're 
falling behind, <laughs> you know, I mean, there's something, there's something monstrous about this, something absolutely monstrous about this. And, and, and the data, the actual experiments that have been done sh have shown that there's no benefit to this. Not only are you depriving children of play, children, I mean kindergarten, it's called kindergarten, there's a garden for children to play in. <laughs> That's what it should be. It's not, it's, not a, it's not an academy, it's not a place for academic instruction, it's just a place for play where children can get together with other children and interact with other children and learn how to socialize, learn all these things that I'm saying you learn in play. Now we're destroying that by, be, by beginning to teach them. The, the research studies, the good research studies that have been done show that not only does it not do any good to start teaching children early, but it actually does harm, there's evidence. And there's been evidence of this sort for a long time and it's just being ignored by people throughout the world. So for example, in the 1970s, the German government got concerned with the question, the, all the German uh, nursery schools, kindergartens originally were play schools, children just played. But somebody got the idea, maybe we should start preparing them for first grade in kindergarten by teaching a certain amount of reading, a certain amount of uh, numbers and arithmetic. Uh, wouldn't hurt to start doing that, to give them some academic instruction. But before they made a mass change in all the schools, they decided let's do a, a study, let's do a research study to see if it does any good to do that. So they did a very well controlled study. They had 50 kindergartens in which they said in these 50 kindergartens we're going to institute a certain amount of academic teaching in these kindergartens to prepare them for first grade. Here's another 50 kindergartens matched, same socioeconomic group, same kind of kids and so on, in which we're going to continue the old way, they're just going to play in these kindergartens. And then we're going to follow them up and see what happens as they develop. Now not surprisingly, when they tested them in first grade for their ability to read and things like that, the kids who had been taught a little bit, not surprisingly, they were a little bit better than the kids who hadn't been taught any of this stuff. Of course, if you're basically telling them the stuff that they are going to be tested on, they'll do a little bit better. They were, when they looked at their social skills, they were worse socially, the ones in the academic. Not surprisingly, they, you learn social skills in play and the academic teaching doesn't help you learn those social skills. So they were socially a little bit behind those in the academic but uh, academically just a little bit ahead. By second grade, there was no difference in academic ability at all. The social difference remained, however. Those with the play, who had just played were still socially more competent. By fourth grade, when they tested them again in fourth grade, those who had no training in reading or arithmetic, anything like that in kindergarten, were now better at reading and arithmetic than those who had training in reading and arithmetic in kindergarten. So the German government said, all right, we've done the experiment. It doesn't work. We're not going to do that. We're going to continue to have play as kindergarten. The rest of the world totally ignored that. <laughs> and they, and including in the United States, there have been now several studies in the United States, well-controlled studies, None of them show any long-term advantage of early academic training and several of them, not all of them, but several of them show a long-term disadvantage. There's one study that was done with inner city kids in which some of them had play in kindergarten and preschool, some of them had academic training in kindergarten and preschool. And in that study, they followed the kids up into young adulthood and they found those that had academic training and less play in kindergarten and preschool were statistically significantly more likely to get into trouble with the law as young adults, more likely to have been arrested for some crime than those who had just played. Somehow that beginning of life in a playful mode where you're not being judged and you're be not being evaluated and you're learning how to get along with other people, that had such a long-term effect that it reduced the likelihood of their getting involved in crime in young adulthood. It also reduced the likelihood of their having, being reported for detention, having, having behavior problems as they're going through school. 
So we do all these things based on these short term findings. In the very short term, of course, if you teach somebody something, they're going to do better at it when you test them. That doesn't mean that down the road they're going to do better. That doesn't mean that by the time they're adults they're going to do any better. So it's just a plea to people, to anybody who's involved in education or anybody who has a child you put into the educational system, to be aware of this and to really challenge the educational establishment about the advisability of taking little kids and making them do this kind of stuff that they, I mean, it's fine if the kid wants to do it. Some children naturally want to read and they begin reading and we shouldn't stop them if they want to do it. But to force them to do it when they're not wanting to do it, that's really abusive in my opinion. It's really child abuse. It's state sanctioned child abuse. In fact, state mandated child abuse in some cases. So I really feel very passionate about that. Uh, and I think that we've, I think that as a, as a world in SAS, it's not just one country or another country, as a world, we've really forgotten the value of play and that children are really designed to develop in play. And we have to come to grips again with that knowledge and bring play back to children's lives. So I've talked longer than I meant to talk. Thank you very much for your kind attention.